Today, Jesus is here by the power of His Holy Spirit and His Holy Word. Jesus is here and He wants to speak to you today and He wants to share with you some powerful truths and ideas about how you can have a new marriage in Jesus. How you can have a marriage that is more uh, satisfying, more fulfilling, more God-honoring and God-glorifying than you ever had before. He wants to give that to you today. And so let's understand how we can have that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. So how can we have this new marriage in Jesus? Well, he starts out with women. And I want to make a lot of people mad today. I knew that coming into this sermon. And I just want to tell you, I'm very sorry. Please don't take it personal. I love everybody in here. I respect everybody in here. And I'm going to try to get through this as delicately as I can get because I'm kind of on a controversial subject here. But I'm going to do the best I can to faithfully relay this message because it convicts me too. I get convicted too. And I have a lot that I have to work on too. So how can we have the new marriage in Jesus? Verse 18. The Bible clearly says this. You can read it right out your translation. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands. Oh boy. Oh boy. What does that mean here? Well, that word submit, that word submit comes from a Greek word. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek. And it's translated into English or Spanish or whatever. And that word submit is used throughout the Bible, but it's also used in um, what some people would call outside of the Bible or extra-biblical literature. And what that word submit means, it's a military term. It was used around military folks. And it means this. To submit means you voluntarily and willingly come up under the leadership and authority of someone else. Very similar to if you've been in the military and say you're a staff sergeant. You are to voluntarily come up under the authority and the leadership of maybe a master sergeant or a lieutenant. You have to come up under him. And he has to lead the way. Now if you're a staff sergeant and you start barking orders at a lieutenant, you're probably going to go AWOL or get demoted. Wouldn't you, Brother Dennis? Something bad would happen. It wouldn't go good if you went against the chain of command. There's a chain of command in the military. There's a chain of command in the church. There's a chain of command in a marriage. You say, why? Because that's the way God set it up. Because if you don't have order, then you have disorder and chaos and confusion. And then no good thing can come from that. Are you with me? You don't want a marriage full of chaos, confusion, anger, and bickering. That's why God wants to get it orderly. He wants to tidy it up so you can have a better, happier marriage. So if you want to get there, wives have to submit to your own husband. Now, let me tell you, because that's really misunderstood. Let me tell you what, that, what submission doesn't mean, and then let me tell you what it really means. Because a lot of people misinterpret this. Okay, what submission does not mean? Okay, submission doesn't mean that your husband is God. It doesn't mean that your husband is a God. If he tells you to do something or wants you to believe something that clearly goes against the teachings of the Holy Bible, you are to respectfully reject that and say, I cannot do that, I cannot believe that, I cannot act like that because that goes against Jesus and my allegiance is ultimately pledged to Jesus, then you. Are you with me? That's, that's a... So glad y'all could be here with us today. And, um, you know, we run out of bulletins today. I didn't figure we'd have this many people, so that's good. Uh, just a couple quick things. You know, we've got a new Facebook page. It's called Freedom Fellowship Church. So if you can, go like that page, and I try to update it. Um, also, check out the YouTube channel. We're getting close to a 1,000 views. We've got people watching these goofy sermons all the way in Australia, Hong Kong, the Caribbean, the United Kingdom. Uh, Indonesia, Hong Kong. What are these people? Don't they have anything better to do than listen to this guy ramble on? But anyway, so, and we have God's kids this morning. Miss Tamika is volunteering for that. 
So if you got any kids like pre-K to maybe fifth grade, if they want to come, they don't have to, but if you want them to come, they're doing that Jesus Storybook Bible, so that's a real good thing for the kids. And I appreciate her volunteering and Meredith. And um, I just think our church is in the right direction. You know, if we have something for the kids on Sunday morning, we have decent preaching, you know, I don't know him, but you just have different roles that God wants you to play to make that marriage work. Because if you start trying to be the general and he starts being the private, then you got a mixed up, messed up bag of mess. <laughs> and that's why a lot of marriages start to suffer and crumble. So biblical submission doesn't mean you're inferior. It doesn't mean your husband is God. Biblical submission does not mean that you don't have your own thoughts and opinions. You can disagree with your husband and you can let him know about it. Now, I'm not saying throw a plan at him and cuss him out, but what I'm saying is you can say, look, <laughs> you know, that's called domestic violence. We don't advocate that, you know, in the church. That's wrong. But you can go to him and say, look, baby, I know you want to go take this trip to Panama City, but we really don't have the money. And maybe we could do something, maybe at, at Water World or something in place of it, because I'm really worried that we don't have the money and we're going to start bouncing checks and we're going to be in a world of hurt. You can disagree with your husband. You can communicate with your husband. You can tell him you think he's dead wrong. So when I say, when the Bible says submit, it doesn't mean that you're a mindless robot and whatever he says and does, you just have to kind of march in tune to what he wants you to do. That's insane. I see some women, or some women that I know seem to act like that. That's not biblical submission. That's slavery. That's, that's mind control. That's something freaky. I don't, I don't quite get that. So it means you can disagree. Biblical submission does not mean that you have to obey your husband's command to sin. If your husband commands you to sin, you don't do it. Just like if the government, we are to submit to the government. But if the government wants me to do something that I know is contrary to Christ and His Word, I have to respectfully disagree and go against our government. If your parents want you to do something that are wrong, you have to respectfully go against your parents because Jesus comes first. Are you with me? Biblical submission does not mean that you do not seek to influence your husband. I kind of already said that. But to submit to your husband doesn't mean you don't try to talk to him. You don't try to communicate with him. You don't try to share your fears and your struggles and your ideas with him. You are to do that. If you're going to truly love him, you're going to do that. So when we say submit... We have to get all those misconceptions out of our mind. Now, let me talk about what biblical submission is. This is what it really means to submit to your husband. First off, it means to love your husband. Love your husband. So what do you mean, Sam, love your husband? That means, what is his love language? I'll give you a great example. If you're going to submit to your husband, learn his love language. You say, what do you mean love language? Well, there was a great book written called The Five Love Languages. If you've never read it, I encourage you to read it. And it says every human being in here and in this world has a love language. And I'm going to tell you the five of them if I can remember them. Some people's love language is physical touch. They like to be held and touched and kissed and all that. All that yucky stuff. The second thing, no, second thing is maybe they like gifts. Some people like you to buy them flowers, chocolate. Buy them a present when you're out on a vacation or wherever. Honey, I brought you something. Oh, I love you so much. You know, they love that, you know. <laughs> Did you buy me that new dress? You know, or whatever. You know, some people, so that it's uh, physical touch, it's, it's gifts. Some people, it's words of affirmation. They like to be encouraged. You know, man, you look good today. Or, man, that was a good, um, that was a good sermon. Or, boy, you sure are good looking or whatever, you know. Thank you, that was a great meal that you cooked. Man, that really hit the spot, you know, or... Or, I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks for washing the dishes. You know, if we didn't, we'd have them piled up to the ceiling. We couldn't get in the kitchen. So, thank God. You know, you try to encourage them. Some people some people need that affirmation, that encouragement. Another love language is um, quality time. Maybe your spouse just likes you to spend quality time with them. Maybe go walk around Abbeville or take them by the hand and, or sit on the back porch and just talk to them. That's, what, that's my love language. You can ask Dion. I love when I just sit around and talk. Go figure, right? Um, and then there was one more. Gifts, acts of service. I can't hear you. Acts of service, that's right. How could I forget that? That's your love language. <laughs> acts of service. They want you to do something. They don't care about the flowers or, hey, baby, you look beautiful. 
Did you help me with the groceries? Did you sweep the floor? Did you cut the grass? Can you help mop the floor? Did you help change the kids' diapers? Did you bring them to school? That's acts of service. Some women want you to express love through that. Okay, some men have that. So learn your husband's love language and respect him and love him in a way that communicates best with him. Learn your husband and show him respect by loving him in that way. You say, I ain't got time, I'm too tired. Well, you got to make time if you're going to have a good marriage. Amen. Marriage is hard, stinking work. And it's you don't never get a day off. It's no days off. I saw a coach, they were playing college football the other day, and he had a big shirt. I think it was for Texas A&M. It had no days off. <laughs> that tickled me. That's marriage. No days off. Amen. So that's what it means to submit. Also, when we say submit to your husband, it means that you will voluntarily follow his leadership. The hook, to submit means that you voluntarily say, God has made you a man. God has made me a woman. My job is to respect you, to love you, and to allow you to lead this family in a way that would glorify Jesus. That's what you got to do. You got to let your husband lead. Your hu Men are made to be leaders. Men should be the leaders. Men should be raising these kids and loving these wives and bringing them to church and, and working in the church and serving in the church because God wants men to be the leaders. Amen? Amen? Where's all the men at? Look at all the absentee fathers. Look at all the people that are just out partying. We need men to rise up and be men. By golly, you're not 15 no more. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. 100 degrees up here. Try not to pass out. So voluntarily follow your husband's leadership. Let your husband be the primary Bible teacher in your home. Submit to your husband means let your husband lead. Encourage him to do family devotionals with the kids. Encourage him to pray with you. If you want to submit to your husband, respect your husband in front of the kids and in front of other people. Quit going to work down in your husband. Quit getting with your girlfriends and bad-mouthing your husband. Quit going to church and bad-mouthing your husband. Quit just bad-mouthing your husband in front of the kids about how sorry and bad and no good he is. You are not respecting your husband when you do that. Are you women? Getting on little toes today. Well, you just don't know how hard he is to live with. Okay, I may not, but that's what the Bible says. So you got two choices. Either you're going to do it your way or you're going to do it God's way. It's just that simple. Respect your husband. Have a humble, gentle, peaceable attitude with your husband. Men don't respond well to nagging, complaining, hollering, screaming women. We have fight or flight. Either we're going to fight them somehow with words or defend ourselves, or we're going to run from it and not want to be around them. If you want to change a man, love him, respect him, do good to him, and you'll get more out of it. You nag, you complain, you bicker and moan, you holler and scream, you're going to make matters worse. Amen. All the men are liking this part. You won't like it when we get to the men part, though. This is a good part for the men and the women getting their toes on, but just men it the other way. Think about that. Think about that. Are you respectful to your husband? Do you allow him to lead? Do you speak his love language? That's what submission is. You let him be the leader. Somebody's got to break the tie. In a marriage, you have to have someone break the tie. If you want to have a good marriage, if you want to have a successful marriage, be respectful and submissive to your husband. Love him. Honor him. Let him be the leader in that home. Are you with me? You know, Matthew Henry had a great quote. He said it, He said something like this. He said, and the reason I'm... Hold on. Let me just stop right there. Go to the last part of this verse. Submit to your husbands. We talked about what it doesn't mean and what it means. Why should you do this? Because it's fitting in the Lord. It is fitting in the Lord. That means it's appropriate. It pleases God. It honors God. It's the way God set up marriage. So, the reason you should submit to your husband is out of love for Jesus. That you want to do it Jesus' way. Amen. Are you with me? That's why you want to do that in a marriage. It's fitting in the Lord. Now, if you go back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God made Adam and Eve in the very beginning, He made the woman from the man. He didn't make the man from the woman. He made the woman from the man. That means the man was to be the leader. Okay? And what did he say about Eve? He said, I'm going to make you a helpmate. I'm going to make you a helper. Listen, ladies, if you want to have a successful marriage, your primary role is to love and respect and submit 
and help your husband and be a, a loving helpmate to your husband. To come alongside him, to support him, to be his confidant, to encourage him, to hold him accountable when he's wrong, to reprove him sometimes. But your job is to respect and let him be the leader and empower him and encourage him and help him and you come up under his guidance and leadership in that home and in that marriage. And I love what Matthew Henry put because what I just described is sometimes called complementarianism. A woman is to compliment the man. She is to come alongside and help the man. And I love what Matthew Henry says. He sums it up like this. He says, God made the woman out of a rib from the side of Adam. God did not make Eve um, from a bone in Adam's head to rule over Adam. God did not make Eve from one of Adam's feet so that she would be trampled upon by him. But God made Eve out of Adam's side so that Eve would be equal with Adam and that she was made up under his arm to be protected by Adam and she was made near Adam's heart so that Eve would be loved by Adam. That's beautiful. Matthew Henry, one of those Puritans. Great guy. That sums up the role of a woman. You're not to try to be a tyrant and domineer your husband. You know, I'm going to run the show. My husband's a moron. i got to get in there and tell him how to do everything. Look, dude, then you shouldn't have married him if he's a moron. Don't marry a moron. If you're dating somebody who you think's a moron, don't marry him. It's just that simple. Don't put, well, we got to get married. No, you don't. What's going to fix our problems? It's going to make more. You're going to have more problems. you got problems now. You're going to have a whole lot more when you get married. You can't run away from them then because then you got kids involved and finances and God knows mortgage and everything else is all tangled up. Think about that. You know, um, you're not to domineer your husband. You're not to be a tyrant. But you're not to be timid either and just let your husband go willy-nilly whatever he wants to do. You are to be his helpmate. Hold him accountable. Respect him. Speak his love language. Love him. And if you do that, your marriage will improve. Amen. That's what God wants you to do, ladies. Men, that's the kind of woman you need to look for. A godly woman who will respect you and follow you. And ladies, you need to look for a man that you can respect and follow. If you can't trust him and respect him and follow him, do not marry him. Amen. Now, let's go to uh, verse 19. Now I'm going to step on the men's toes a little bit. I think you'll like this part here. It says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That's it. That's all he says. Husbands, love your wives. Now that word love is the Greek word agape. And that means um, agape is an interesting word because what it means is do good to your wife whether she deserves it or not. Do good to your wife be kind to your wife, support your wife, take care of your wife, protect your wife, whether she deserves it or not. That's love. It's not a feeling. See, some people say, I feel in love. Love is not an emotion. Love in the Bible is a verb. It is a choice or an action that you make, irregardless of how you feel. Amen. Are you with me? Man, I like it. It's like a marriage counseling session, and I need to be in it too. I'm so glad, I tell you. This is some good stuff helping me out. Love your wives. I don't care how, how whether she's a Christian, whether she's a non-Christian. Whatever situation you find yourself in, love your wife, whether she's a nagger, a complainer, a, a, a depressed soul. You love her. You do good to her. How many of y'all have ever seen that movie by Kirk Cameron called The Love Dare? If you've never seen that movie or read the book, The Love Dare, it's a great one. Check it out. But it basically talks about this verse. And he's trying to win over his wife. His wife is ready to file for divorce, mostly because of stuff he's been doing that's wrong and bad. And he tries to win her back over by showing her agape love. That's what we are to do as men. To be the leader in a home, to be the head of the home, doesn't mean you get to be a dictator or a king walking around. It means God holds you ultimately responsible for the health and protection and well-being of your wife. God holds you responsible as a man to love your wife. And listen, if you truly love your wife, your wife will submit to you. More than likely. Now, not every woman will do that. They are they some, they some good, good men and bad men. They some good women and bad women. 
matter what you do for some of them, they're still going to be crazy. But generally speaking, if you love your wife, you got to love this preacher. I don't know why y'all ain't firing me by this point. I don't know what other church would put up with this. You have to love your wife. And as you love your wife and you do good to your wife, she will, normally speaking, respect and submit and follow you better. Amen. That's what leadership is. You know, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, who did God call out? He said, Adam, where are you? Now, why didn't He call for Eve? Because Adam was left in charge to protect, provide, and take care of Eve and to help her. And instead of doing what God had called him to do in his God-given role, he abdicated or gave up that role, let Eve do whatever she wanted to do, and he did not do what he was supposed to do. Therefore, we're in the mess that we're in today because some people didn't do what they were supposed to be doing in a marriage relationship. Men are called to be the leaders. The buck stops with you as a man. If your wife is not flourishing, if she's not happy, if she's not growing spiritually, if she's not being provided for, it ultimately falls on your shoulders to try to do that. Now, some women cannot be appeased no matter what you do. But you need to try your best to do it. You're not doing it for her. You're doing it for Jesus. That's what it ultimately boils down to. Love your wife. Now, you say, how can I love my wife? Well, learn her love language. What is your wife's love language? Well, I don't know. Try to figure it out. Once I figured it out, it helped us out a lot. A lot. I thought she'd want to sit around and talk like me. She don't care nothing about that. I love to sit around and talk. I ain't got time to do that, Sam. I got stuff that's got to be done. What, what, what can I do to help you? Well, you want to do the dishes sweet before? Grass needs to be cut. You know, then when you do that, then it's like, wow, that's good. Now we're making progress. Now she's actually smiling a little bit. That's good. Now we're taking a step in the right direction. You learn your spouse's love language. You choose to do good to her no matter what. Some other ways that you can show your wife love is make sure that you teach your kids to respect and honor your wife, their mama. One of the greatest ways to love your wife is to back up and support your wife. And I have failed at that at times. You know, you, you stand up for your wife. You defend your wife. You support your wife. You got your wife's back. She's supposed to have your back. That's the way it's supposed to be. If you really want to love your wife, be patient be kind, be slow to anger, and always be honest with your wife. No matter what. Show love to your wife. Always be honest with her. Always be kind. Be patient. Sometimes women are, you know, I'm, and men kind of get fired up and they, they let the tempers flare and they get hyped up over things that we're sitting there thinking, why is she so mad about this? Just be patient. Be kind. I'm preaching to myself because I don't always react that way, but that's what I'm supposed to do. Be patient. Be kind. Relax. Take a deep breath. Say a prayer for her. And show love to her even though in that moment she may not deserve it. And if you do that, your marriage will get better. Because women want to feel loved. Amen? You know, I've read a statistic here. You may like this. and I, I forgot to do it on the men. but I read this statistic right here about why women have affairs. Why do women leave their marriages and commit adultery? These are the top five reasons that women leave their husbands and commit adultery. Number five, the need for family commitment. That means women want a man that's valuing her and the family above his interest and his hobbies. Nothing wrong with having your friends and hobbies, but a woman wants to feel like this man loves me and the family is going to take care of us. Right, ladies? Number four, fourth reason why women get divorces is because they don't feel like they have any type of financial security or well-being. You know, it's hard to stay married to somebody if he's blowing all the money every week and you don't know how the bills are going to get paid. Number three, the need for honesty. Sometimes a woman will leave you because she feels like you're not shooting straight with her. You're not being honest. Number two, the need for conversation. Women want to have conversation. And number one, this is the number one reason why women leave their husbands. They need affection. They need affection. They need love. Put your arm around her. Say, baby, I love you. I appreciate what you've been doing. Thanks for helping me out. Thanks for cooking. Thanks for helping with the kids. Thanks for all you do. Imagine how happier your marriage would be if the husband took the lead and really complimented and respected and loved his wife. I'm telling you, it would change the whole thing, wouldn't it? Amen. Wouldn't it? That's what we need men to do. That's what we need men to do. You know, if you want to show love to your wife, schedule regular date nights where you go out to eat, just you and her. 
Be tender and compassionate and understanding with, with your wife. Desire her happiness. Protect, provide your wife. Protect and provide and uh, take care of your wife. Let me end with this about husbands loving your wives. As a Christian husband, your most important relationship is Jesus, number one. And then you know what your next relationship is or what should be the next most important relationship in your life as a man? should be the, the relationship you have with your wife. That's what it should be. You should go Jesus, your spouse, then your kids, then your job or whatever else you got going on. Not Jesus, the kids, and then your spouse. You got to stay connected with your spouse. Husbands got to take the lead to love, to, to respect, to cherish, and to honor their wives. Amen? Now let me say one more thing. That was a radical concept when Paul wrote this. Because way back then, women were second class citizens. They couldn't vote. They weren't properly educated. They didn't have the respect that a lot of women have today. So for God to sit there and tell husbands to love and treat your wives right, that was a radical idea because back then women didn't have many rights. But as we read the Bible, we understand that women are just as valuable as men. And if you don't respect and love your wife, you're not going to be in fellowship with God. And I would even question your own salvation. Are you women? So if you want to do that new marriage in Jesus, love your wives. The last part right here. Do not be harsh with them. So actively you should love your wives, but negatively you should not be bitter and harsh to your wife. What does that mean? That means don't be sharp. Don't be mean. Don't be condescending. Don't be cruel. Don't be ugly and unnecessarily unkind with your wife. Be kind. Be compassionate. Be patient. Be understanding. Forgive her of the things that she might have said or done to you, irregardless of whether she deserves it. Forgive her and show compassion and kindness and patience and meekness. Treat her the way Jesus treats you. That's it. Don't be bitter or harsh to your wife, no matter what she has said or done to you. Forgive her. Now let me say this. Are there certain circumstances when maybe you should divorce your wife or your husband? Are there certain circumstances when you may need to have a biblical separation from your wife or husband? Yes, sometimes if you're in a physically or verbally abusive relationship, you need to get out of it and call the police. Sometimes you need to tell the leaders of the church, and church discipline needs to be started if that person's a professing Christian. If they're not, then you may need to go to your pastor and then go to the police and get out of that. Amen? God doesn't want you to stay and endanger you and the life of your kids. But what we're saying is, generally speaking, God wants you as a husband, to not be bitter to your wife, to not abuse your wife, to love your wife. And he wants the wife to respect and submit and follow to the husband's loving leadership. And if both people will commit to doing it, it takes two to tango, right? If the husband will be the leader and do his part by the power of the Holy Spirit, and if the wife will do her part by the power of the Holy Spirit, and check this out, as you set your mind on Jesus, and as you love your wife, and respect her and cherish her and do good to her as Jesus has been to you, and as the wife submits and honors and respects and follows the leadership of her husband, as you keep doing that, you will get closer and closer together, and the intimacy and romance and happiness in your marriage will dramatically increase over time. Amen? That's the secret to it. That's the secret. Praise God the kids are back probably 500 degrees back there. I can only imagine how hot it is. So I want to, so I want to uh, close us in prayer today. That's it. That's all I got for you. And it's 1051. Can you believe it? How long have I preached? Ah, oh, well, that's still a long sermon. I was hoping to keep it under 30 minutes. But as I pray, my hope and prayer for you today is for all the ladies out there that are married or thinking about getting married, think about what God has said to you today. Are you the type of woman that respects your husband? Do you respect him in front of the kids, in front of other people? Do you allow him to lead or are you always nagging and complaining trying to dominate and domineer him? Listen, you're going to wreck your marriage because you're not living it God's way. Repent of it. Make a fresh commitment. All the ladies out there, make a fresh commitment today that you are going to love and respect and honor your husband no matter what, no matter how good or bad he is. You're going to treat Him the way Christ treats you and you're going to love Him and do good to Him and you're going to respect Him and submit to Him. And God will honor you and bless you for that. And all the men out there, 
May you make a fresh commitment today that you're going to love your wives as Jesus loved the church. To sacrifice, to take care, to provide, to protect, to lead your wife and your family and be that leader God wants you to be. To love her as Jesus loves you. Will you make that commitment all the men out there? And no matter what she does, don't be bitter towards her. She may not be submitting. You say, my wife will not submit to me. What do I do? Well, you don't become bitter. You don't become angry. You don't abuse her. What you do is you pray for her, you love her, you do good to her, and you keep on doing that, and you let God do His work because you can't control what your spouse does. You can only control what you do. And God is there with you in that marriage. His Holy Spirit is within you, and He will give you the strength and the ability to endure it and do what you've got to do to glorify Him in that marriage. Amen. Amen. He's going to help you. He's going to be with you. You say, you don't understand what it's like. You don't understand, Sam. I know I probably don't, but God understands. God gets where you're at. And God is there to help you. But we got to do our part and say, God, I'm going to be the woman you want me to be by submitting to my husband. And I'm going to be the man you want me to be by loving my wife. And not being ill and abusive and bitter towards her. And as both people commit to doing that for Jesus and by His strength and by His power, for His glory, your marriage will increase and become better and better. And you will have more satisfaction and fulfillment in that new marriage that Jesus wants to give you. Amen. Amen. That's the last thing I had to say right there. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I want you to do what God is leading you to do, however He wants you to respond. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be glad to talk to you after church. You can email me, contact me. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Was it okay? I guess it would do. You know, it was a C plus and you know, C minus.